Hey, thank you everyone for joining us today. And I'm super excited because I get to talk to Colin Thomas Perry. He is the author of Dying to Be Alive. And we previously had an interview with Colin a few months ago. And he described in, in great detail um, his NDE experience, his uh, near-death experience. And since then, we've had a lot of good views and a lot of good questions. So we thought we'd have Colin back again. And what I'd like to do is just start off um, with Colin introducing himself and just giving us like a synopsis of his near-death experience for those of you that have not heard about it. It's quite astounding. So Colin, please, uh, if you could give us uh, just a good overview of what happened to you again, and we can take it from there. Yeah, certainly. Look, um, C. Thomas Perry is my, my author name. I, I'm a PhD in media. I'm a, a university lecturer. Uh, but uh, this is in an entirely different realm, of course, what happened to me when I was 49 years of age. I actually suffered a heart attack. And uh, I was basically found myself floating in darkness and called out to Jesus because I was a Christian prior to this and called out to Jesus because that was... The only thing I knew because I felt myself sinking, I felt myself going down into the darkness and I was afraid. So naturally, I just cried out, Jesus, help me. And he He came and actually grabbed me and pulled me upward. And I found myself sitting amongst a group of angels, which was absolutely awesome. Uh, these, these angels were beautiful, powerful, wise, eternal. Uh, I've never felt so small in my life as being with these angels, uh, I felt like like an infant next to them they were just so wise we were communicating with thought there was no speech and this i know from reading a lot of nde accounts is universal it is just the way things are in that realm there is not speech it is just communication directly mind to mind soul to soul so you can feel entirely what it is that these angels were thinking and it was quite an incredible experience to to undergo that uh, well, uh, I asked who this person was who came to save me, and yes, sure, sure enough, he said, I'm the one you call Lord. So I knew I was actually seated in the presence of Jesus, and he he did some healing on me, and I actually joined with him very, very closely just for this few few minutes and felt the power of who he is and what his wisdom and understanding and, and presence and knowledge of the universe is all about, and that was an experience I will never forget that's changed me for life coming to know just how universal and powerful Jesus truly is. Uh, he, he then gave me the choice to come back into my life. And I had, at the time, I had a, a daughter in a wheelchair and, and young children, and I really felt I needed to come back and be their father. So he did agree to send me back. He showed me things to come in my life. He just showed me things to come in general. Um and then he just sent me back into my body, which was a very rude shock because being with him and being with those angels was such a beautiful environment. It was filled with love. It was absolute overflowing love and the most beautiful experience I've ever had. And the decision to come back was a very, very hard one. I really had to wrestle with myself not to just stay there because I wanted so much to stay there. It was such a beautiful place to be. Uh, but I came back and... and a lot of realizations on coming back as to just how oppressive and dark this world is in comparison uh, and how limited our human existence is uh, after experiencing that spiritual existence for a short period of time. One, one interesting factor of it was that I felt like I'd been there for about half an hour with the Lord and with angels. And when I came back and was was revived in the ambulance, they uh, they told me I'd only been gone for one minute, which was just incredible. I, I realised there's two entirely different time frames at work here. The, the time we experience here is not the same as the time in heaven. It's a very different different uh, dimension, I, I guess you would have to say. But that's a very brief summary. Uh, it's gone on in my life. I've experienced dreams and visions and, and all sorts of things since then that have uh, kept on with this sort of he heavenly connection, I guess you would call it, uh, which still goes on to this day. And uh, I'm very, very grateful to God for that. Yeah. Thank you, Colin. Um, 
what what have you had recently? Have you experienced anything recently in terms of that connection to heaven and to God? Anything you could share with us that was profound or you knew that it was the Lord speaking to you through some type of message? Look, it, it, there's a lot of dreams. I, I tend to have a lot of dreams, and these dreams tend to be hooked into reality and, and things that are happening and things that will come to pass. And um, I, I remember having multiple dreams, repeating dreams about huge tidal waves coming in towards me, and uh, these tidal waves would break and then they would be nothing but, but froth at my feet, you know. And uh, I, I just talked to God and said, God, please show me what this means. And he started telling me that there are waves that are coming. There's waves of the Holy Spirit coming across the world. He said, and this is before all the wars that have broken out. This was before Ukraine and before the Middle East. And he said, there's waves. There's going to be war. First, there's going to be war. He said, and, and then there's going to be uh, natural disasters, the like of which we've never seen on the earth. Um, that's the sort of thing he, he was showing me. That's probably the most notable and memorable one that I have had. Uh, so the things he has said so far have, have, been, um, have been coming true. In the longer term, I, 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 hope, I hope it's not too severe. But he says there will be very severe natural disasters that will hit the earth. Was this a recent revelation or? Two years, I guess. Two years ago, yeah. Well, it seems to be pretty accurate in terms of what's mm. going on on the planet today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, okay, so... Some people wanted clarification on, um, well, actually, there were a lot of comments and emails about questions, and of course, I couldn't answer them, so um, that's why, of course, I reached out to you again. They had read that there's three types of NDEs, uh, inverse, the void, and the hellish, and I wanted to know if you had any, because I did research them, and you know, every we talked about this briefly in our last conversation. Everyone's NDE is different, of course, different experience. Um, any clarification on the types of NDEs and what your thoughts are on why they can be so varied and so different? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to speak on that for a while. Look, um, I, as I was saying, I, I experienced the, the fear and darkness and drifting down. And what I experienced there was a void, is the exact word I, I use, a void of nothingness beneath me. And I was very afraid of that void. It was just like no light, no time, nothing. It was emptiness. Uh, so, yeah, I can really appreciate the, the people who talk about the void uh that i did experience but crying out to jesus was what lifted me above that and and i think back to what he said when he was on earth you know anyone who calls on the name of the lord will be saved it's a, a very straight statement um and that was my experience but look about these different things hellish now i i mean we know there is there is a, a darker dimension Beneath, I guess the, it, it is very much scaled from my experience. I can see that there is beneath this dimension, there is lower dimensions. And I guess that's what people refer to as hell. It's interesting to note that even in the Bible, there's not a single word for hell. Hell comes in, it's translated as hell, but there's a lot of different words with a lot of different concepts behind that. There's one called Sheol, which is from the Hebrew, and that, that is just the place of the dead, the place where the dead go. And rest and, mm -hmm. and, and wait. Uh, there is a, a concept called Gehenna, which is a New Testament concept, which was a valley next to next to Jerusalem where they used to sh throw the rubbish. It's the valley where they used to do human sacrifice when in the bad old days. Uh, and so that was considered like getting rid of the rubbish, throwing it into Gehenna, uh, which is where the smoke used to rise up as things were being burnt and. Uh, like a rubbish tip, basically. Uh, and then there's there's also Hades, the concept of Hades, which is the underworld. So there's a lot of different different concepts in there that in, in the English we just translate as hell. So it's a little more complex and convoluted than that. 
And I think a lot of a lot of the hell understandings that we have actually come from Dante rather than from the Bible. Uh, I, I don't believe in eternal punishment where where demons are constantly poking people with pitchforks forever. I, I really don't think that fits in with what the Bible says or with what God says. Sure, the smoke of their torment rises up forever, but I, I don't think it's an eternal punishment where, where God is just vindictively punishing those who have sinned for all eternity. I, I just don't share that view of heaven, of hell rather. I, I just think it's it's not strictly what the Bible actually tells us. So I'm a bit dubious about very gruesome, grotesque scenarios. I've read a few of them, and I think you know, maybe God is trying to scare people into rethinking their life. And I really think that's what's at the root of it is, is if you don't rethink your life, this might be what happens to you. Uh, and, and that, I think, is a, is a fair warning. I, I think God will punish those who do evil. Uh, and, and I think that is a reality. But, yeah, there's a, there's a slight difference between that and... The, the traditional medieval concept of hell, which is what the church seems to have inherited, and um, I, I don't entirely share it. I do believe in punishment for evil, but I don't believe in that particular model. I don't think the Bible teaches it. The um, what was the other one that said it was the heavenly one? So there's the heavenly, the void, and the, the hell. Void, right? hellish, and um, in I think it was inverse. What's so? That's what's described what's meant as, by the inverse? Um, it says. Inverse NDEs occur when the common pleasant features of NDE experiences are not pleasant. Inverse NDEs take place when the when the features of, of that experience are gruesome. Like, for example, seeing white light is often a source of comfort and peace. However, in the inverse NDE, the white light might appear threatening and bring on panic or depression. I've never heard of that one before. So I don't yeah, know, maybe right. it's like a trickery or I've never heard of anybody seeing a white light and because I have heard people say that have had NDEs, if you see a white light, don't go towards it. And I'm yeah. always perplexed by that. But I guess that's what they're talking about. Look, it's I understand the rationale. And the rationale is the white light. Once you go to the white light, you have died. You're gone. Uh, uh, and I think that's that's where the fear comes comes in. And I experienced this after I had died. I was experiencing fear that, oh, boy, I'm dead. That was my initial source of fear. It was the awareness that I was dead. And that's what made me the most afraid, was um, not knowing where I was, where I was going, what was happening. That, that initial period of uncertainty immediately after I died. And I think, well, there is a transition period from my experience and everything I've read. There is a transition period immediately after you die that is between your life and where you are going and it's a journey it's a transition and often it does involve travel then it certainly did for me jesus lifted me up you know at a very rapid rate over a very long distance whatever that means in that dimension uh so i think this fear of the light this negativity is probably the fear of death playing out in, in the people who are experiencing this and all the things they've heard about, don't go to the light, don't go to the light. Yeah, that would make you depressed and scared and afraid. Um, but certainly not my experience. Uh, the, the, the place I went to, look, they told me quite clearly where I was, was not paradise. This was not the end goal. They said, we've come out to meet you. We've come out to meet you and basically give you the choice if you wanted to go back or not. So I was given a very clear choice on that. But um, it was a lit, they were lit that were in a lit, I could actually see a glow coming from within them. So, it, it, and there was a light, but I could see off in the distance that there was this massive glow. And I'd say that was coming from the actual heavenly realm and, and, and the paradise realm. Uh, and, and I was aware of that. And there's nothing I wanted more than to head towards that light. Like that was really calling me, calling me. And if it wasn't for the, the children who needed me, I would have been there today. Yeah. Um, but I did come back for their sake. Yes, of course. But, yeah, look, that's my understanding of, of what might cause that sort of inverse NDE. I haven't really read or heard much about that one, but uh, that would be my my take on that for yeah, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes the most sense, really. Did You didn't see 
a white light when you first felt that you passed you you experienced that void of nothing right and then you called that, that was beneath me it was very definitely beneath me underneath i wasn't in the void but i was sinking towards it which made me afraid and the more afraid i was the more i sank downward so that was my first experience and i've read of others who've been through this and they they sink down into this this dark nothingness uh, but often things happen then where where they are picked up or they are they are brought to a light now the light for me was jesus he was he was light all along in this situation um and i suspect he's the light in every nde to be honest uh, that's what i actually believe whether or not he reveals his identity or not he didn't immediately to me i actually had to ask him who he was uh, and, and that is very common in NDEs, that they will see a glowing light or an angel or something that manifests the light of God and um, doesn't necessarily give itself a name or an identity, but it communicates with them. It emanates love. That is probably the one common factor, mm -hmm. is that it always emanates love. It emanates goodness uh, and wants to help people it's a very positive force that wants to help people um, onward to heaven or back to their life and usually very much that initial experience in an nde is where are you going yeah, are you heading back to your sure. life what are you going to go on obviously all the ndes we hear about are those who've come back right obviously yeah um yeah. folks also asked about what what they can do to help doctors understand and and kind of like be more accepting of ndes like what what can be done to open up you know this to like the medical community because i think a lot of people have had them i mean there were a lot of comments of people that have had them but they were afraid to tell their doctor afraid to tell their family so do you think there's anything that can be done to educate like the medical community and do you think that they're starting to open up about that there are plenty of doctors who are coming around often through personal experience or the personal experience of friends some are actually starting research projects to look into this more deeply uh, i've done a bit of reading on this there's the um, near-death experience research foundation uh, is worth looking into now um they wrote a book a while back I remember one of the authors was called Perry. The other one, I think, was called Long. And um, it was analysing a lot, about 2,500 different near-death experiences and talking about the common factors and how they all align and using it as, as uh, data for running sort of trials on how reliable this evidence was. And it came up pretty well above, you know, st statistically significant that there had to be some substance to this because there was so much in common um there was certain factors that just happened across all of the ndes and although we say there's a lot of different ones i i think you know the universe is a massive big place far bigger than we're aware of mm -hmm. uh, that's just the physical universe let alone when we're entering into heavenly dimensions or hellish dimensions uh it's a it's a really gigantic list of possibilities out there and i don't think because people have died i don't think everything needs to align perfectly and be the same for every person it's certainly not for us in our life on earth and i don't see any reason why it would be there um so really there's this huge variety of of possibilities that can happen and yet certain things are really common and, and happen to almost everybody one of them is that that love that comes to them, this love, loving God. And most of them have the courage to say, yes, well, this was God. There's no question that this was God. Some people, probably because of their earthly way of thinking, won't admit that it's a God, but it was a light and it was loving and it was talking to me. So, I mean, that's uh, pretty obvious to me where that's coming from. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's really a complex situation to try and convince i guess the medical profession of the reality of this because it's so out there in comparison to what we understand 
Uh, as far as the medical profession is concerned, all thought is just the result of chemicals within the brain and neurons firing, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this is the point at which the evidence for MDEs is very strong because so much of what people experience happens when there is zero brain activity. It's not showing up. There is no brain activity. They're often wired up with ECGs and there's a flat line. There's nothing there. So how can this be brain activity that they're experiencing? It can't. It just can't be brain activity. Uh, and I think that's a very powerful argument against the medical profession. The other one is the, the things that people are coming back with in terms of um, what they've experienced and, and been aware of, like as they are floating around the roof or down the corridor or whatever. And there's a lot of, a lot of experiences where people are able to for example, one I've heard of where, where this person drifted down to a room down the corridor four or five rooms away and heard a conversation there and then came back and when they were revived, they were able to tell the doctor, this is what I heard, four or five rooms down the corridor and the doctor confirmed that's exactly what happened. Other, other times when they've just been in the room and, and zero brain activity and they've said... Um, to the doctor, uh, the doctor said, oh, I've lost my keys. And they've said, oh, you put them in the drawer. You put them in the third drawer down or whatever. And the doctor goes, and yes, the keys are in there. And they've actually seen what's been going on while there's been zero brain activity. Uh, so that is a very strong argument against the medical profession that says there is only thought and chemicals within the brain that drive us like some machine. Certainly, certainly not what I experienced. Uh, in fact, I was really delighted to have my brain quiet for a challenge <laughs> when, I, when I'd actually died. But I actually felt this very, very beautiful clarity of just being I, me. None of the second thinking, calculating, what if, maybe, doubts, fears, all that stuff just, just sort of gradually drifted away and, and I found myself more and more just becoming that part of me that I call I was, was very pure and very clean. And I realised, well, so much of what we go through in terms of doubts and fears and anxieties is just, just the brain cycling stuff. It's just like a machine just ticking over. And um, it's quite a liberating experience to be set free from that for a little while okay. and to understand that's exactly what it is. Yeah, I could imagine. Uh, what about the folks that have had... Um, hellish NDEs. Do you think that that was like the Lord's way of scaring them? Because most of them that I've seen have repented after and it, they dramatically changed their lives. So what's just your take on, because some of them are really hellish, like they're scary. I, I know, I'm aware. I've read a few yeah. and, and they are really hellish yeah. and, and I understand that. Look, I'm not saying there is no dimension of what we understand to be hell. I, I actually believe something like that does exist. Uh, it, it's difficult to understand. I think we're living in a, a, a universal layer cake, uh, effectively, uh, and we're somewhere around the middle and above us. I mean, it's interesting in the Bible, the Apostle Paul talks about a man who went to the third heaven and heard things that could not be repeated in words. So the third heaven indicates immediately there's, there's levels of heaven yeah. going on and there's obviously also levels beneath so it's a multi-layered i won't even call it a universe it's a multiverse i, I believe there's all sorts of different dimensions that, that exist science is just barely beginning to discover dark matter and things like that that, that indicate there are other other dimensions out there whether what they're discovering, I don't know. I just hope they're not uncovering hell, you know, <laughs> quite frankly. But um, this this hellish thing, I, I believe what you just said is is the answer. This is my sense that God is allowing them to see this so that they will change their life, so that they will head towards the kingdom of heaven, not towards the kingdom of hell. That is something in our lives. Look, in this dimension, we measure things by finances, physical health, right. power, you know, those sorts of things are what we measure our life by in this dimension. But but Jesus and, and the whole Bible and most religions, actually, 
tell us that that is not the true measure of life and that the true measure of life is to do with a measure of good and evil, life and death. They are the things that really matter. So we need to be heading towards, obviously, the good side of that scale and the most powerful force by all measures, by NDEs, by, by religious teachings, is love. The, the most powerful force in the universe is love, which means the opposite of that is hate. So um, I, I believe God is scaring people away from living in hate or unforgiveness or resentment or whatever and drawing them towards forgiveness, love, peace, joy, all the things that go with that heavenly realm. Uh, and to show them a little bit of this, I think, is a very powerful and effective tool. I know my my partner um, actually nearly died many years ago and um, she went and came back but didn't see anything and she's just prayed to God and said, why, why didn't I see anything? And she was not in a good state then. This was due to uh, drug addiction at the time, many years ago. And um, God just sort of said to her, you know, in, in his little way, just said you would not have been able to cope with what you would have seen if you had died at that at that point. Uh, and I think there is a definite link between the state your life is in and where you go when you pass over. A very definite link. And I mean, let, let's face it, the whole New Testament's telling us that from start to finish. You, you need to you need to repent. And repent is a word that actually means transform your way of thinking. Mm. Uh, you need to change your life towards love is the basic message really when you peel it down uh, to believe in jesus to believe in love to believe in god and to love people that is that is the core of what um, christianity teaches and i'm glad you touched on that because people were also i guess frustrated at the thought that um heaven was only for like a chosen group of people and that even if you believed in Jesus, that depending on how you live your life would determine your entrance into heaven. And I know you kind of touched on that when we spoke, because you mentioned that just believing in Jesus was what Jesus wanted, right? Like that would bring give us salvation. I know we talked about that a little bit, but because all we have are the Ten Commandments, really, we don't have a other than the Bible, which sadly many people don't read, we don't have like a, a manual on how to be a good person, how to, you know, and, and it's it's sometimes difficult for us. So what I guess my question is, is believing in, in Jesus enough and and praying enough? Like, what does it take to gain entrance? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a great question. It's a big, big, big question. Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk for a little while on this because yes, I've right thought deeply. I have thought very deeply about this. Awesome. Even in the Bible, it does not say that anyone who's a Christian is going to be saved. I'm sorry for all those people who deeply believe that. But if you read, there's one particular story Jesus tells where he's on the judgment seat and people are being brought to him and saying, didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I heal the sick in your name? Didn't I do this in your name? And he says to them, go away. I never knew you. All right. So, sorry, they were Christians. Okay, they were Christians. Obviously, if they're coming to him and saying that, that's Christian people being rejected. So we really can't argue that automatically, bang, the moment you're a Christian, you're, you're saved and in heaven. Jesus does not say that. He does not say that. Uh, but I think there is a, a concept. He said, believe in me and be baptized and obey my commandments. That's what he said. What were his commandments? To love God, to love people. That, they're the two main commandments that he left us. I think that's what you're looking for. It's so simple. People overlook it. That is the rule. That is the law by which people are gaining entrance into heaven in the long run is how they love and, and whether they love or whether they hate. And um, there is this thing called the life review. Uh, I, I felt it. I didn't experience it quite so literally as some other people. But when people die, they they go through their life. 
they, they see the things that perhaps they are ashamed of. They understand this this thing the Bible calls sin is actually things to do with hate. It's things to do with greed. It's things to do with hurting people. Uh, they're the sort of things that that come back on you when, when you pass over. And I, I felt filthy dirty just being in their presence, just being human. I felt filthy dirty. And this is something that's interesting in, in all of the prophetic visions, a lot of the prophetic visions where prophets were taken into heaven in the Bible, they, they all said the same thing. I'm a man of unclean lips. I, I've, I, I'm not worthy. And that's the, that's the feeling you get when you're in their presence. It, it's like we really are tainted, stained uh, in, in our lives. So this is where Jesus comes in because he says, you know, I, I will wash that clean. I'll wipe that out. I will cast that into the deepest ocean. You, your sins will be removed as far as the east is from the west, which is infinite. Uh, that is what Jesus came to do, was to say, it's not a fair deal. I'm now bringing you the fair deal, which is forgiveness. Like all men were condemned under the first Adam, all men are forgiven under Jesus if they just choose to love and to believe in him. That's the message he came to say. Does this mean the chosen few in the church self-proclaimed um, saints? Mm, not necessarily. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. He's not uh, upholding institutions like that. He's not upholding humans as the judge. No, this he came. He says, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. And, and people who want to take advantage of that opportunity to be saved, I think it is effectively a guarantee. If you live your life by love and if you believe in him, I do believe it is a guarantee. Does that mean everyone else is excluded? No, not even the Bible says that. Uh, it's Romans chapter 2. I can actually go right to the chapter. Where, where Paul says, even those who do not know the law will be judged according to the words of their mouth and their thoughts. They will be judged according to how they have lived. Their so thoughts. it's actually that, written in there. Mm. That part scares me a little bit. Could we clarify, if you don't mind? Because I always believed that it's a person's actions that matter and not so much the thoughts. Because we can have thoughts that we don't necessarily mean like you can be angry and have a nasty thought about someone, but would you ever hurt them? Of course not. How? Mm. So how does the Bible put thoughts in there? Are thoughts evil in and of themselves, Colin? I absolutely believe they are. Um, Jesus said that himself. <clears throat> he, he's well, I'm just trying to think of the exact words that he used, which was um to, to even look on a woman with lust is to commit adultery, right? So, so it's the intention that we are judged by, right? So um, it is, in fact, our thoughts that matter. When, when I was over there, it, it, the thoughts were everything. It's how we think, how our heart and our soul, they're the things that we're judged on. Uh, so it's what we intend. Now, sure, look, we have our failings. We get angry. We we go off the edge sometimes. That that does happen, and it happens to everybody without exception. And that is why Jesus came to bring the better deal, because he knew all humans are subject to this. He understood. He was God brought into a human body. He understood what we were going through and how unjust it was. So he he has actually come to bring a new form of justice, which is forgiveness and love. Uh, the the intentions of the heart. It's a very interesting thing to study um, in in scriptures because that's what God looks on. It says He looks on the intentions of the heart. So, what do we mean to do? If we want to help someone and we're trying to help them, and something goes wrong and it screws up and messes up and and things go awry. That's not the intention of our heart, and we won't necessarily be judged on that. We'll be judged on what we are trying to do, on what we are seeking to bring into the world, not necessarily on the actual physicality of, of what happens. I, I think, you know, that's what really is at the core of it. So Jesus knows our intention, but oftentimes intention doesn't line up with our thoughts. Because like I said before, sometimes out of anger or whatever, hurt, 
you can be hurt by someone's actions and maybe say, you know, I can't stand that SOB or something. You're thinking it. You wouldn't tell that person that, right? You know, maybe that's just because they hurt you. But your intention is pure. You would never hurt them. You would never say that to them. Hmm. Is that what you're talking about? Like two different things? Yeah. Yeah, it is very much what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, look, Jesus himself got pretty angry on a few occasions. Right. Uh, he, when he was talking to the Pharisees, it was, you brood of vipers, you hypocrites. You know, he wasn't being all lovey-dovey to the Pharisees. No, he was He was mad. He was angry. It's what, what you call, you know, divine righteous anger. 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 Yeah. Yeah, righteous anger. Uh, and, and also, like, in the temple, when there's, they're making profits out of selling selling things for sacrifice and, and ripping people off, he turned over the tables and whipped them out of the temple. You know, this was not a gentle little man who wasn't, you know, able to act in the physical world in, in justice. He was very concerned with justice and intentions of the heart, and he knew. He knew what they were thinking. He knew exactly what they were thinking and what they were saying. He was able to turn around to the Pharisees at times and say, I know exactly what you're thinking and you're wrong and tell them why. Um, very amazing, amazing being, Jesus Christ, incredible. Yes. Uh, even more so now. So he, he is aware. And I felt that when I was with him and he actually healed me and I felt his, his power and his presence within me directly. I actually understood he does know every thought and every process that we have. He is aware of that. That is accessible to him. So we can't hide things from God. It's just not possible to hide things from God. We can hide them from ourselves and from the world, but no, he knows. He knows all that we do, which is a very, very scary thought for, for everyone, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a real incentive for us to live with a clear conscience and in love, uh, you know, and that's what God wants for us. It's a great outcome if we do that. It's not something to be afraid of. But look, going back to what you're saying about the exclusive group thing, and I, I really am frustrated by that in the church in this time, that the church is so intent on saying, we are the chosen ones, look at us. Uh, whereas really... What, is, what does Jesus say about it in his parables? It's the one that says, no, I'm a sinner, forgive me. They're, that's what he respects. That's what God loves. Not look at me, you should live like me, but I am so sorry for the, for the things I've done wrong and I'm trying to restore and change my way of life, my way of living, restore myself to a life that is more aligned with love. Uh, that's what Jesus respects. That's what he loves. That's what God loves. That's good to know. Thank you for clarifying that. I think that's going to help a lot of folks. Did, did you actually have a life review or what was that like for you? It, it was, look, there wasn't, I didn't have the traditional sort of movie running before my eyes, but it was a sense I had when I was in the presence, just, just in the presence of the angels. I mean, I'm no angel myself, that's for sure. I've done a lot of things very wrong. And they, I felt them as if I was stained. As I said before, I felt filthy, dirty. I, I felt, oh, oh, that stuff hasn't gone away necessarily. It's It sticks. It, it sticks to your soul. It, it's like, um, yeah, clothing that's got stains on it is the best way of putting it. And... Uh, that's when I actually said, I actually, well, said or thought or communicated, I said, I, I believe in the blood of Jesus. I believe in the forgiveness of, of the covenant of Jesus and communion and, and all those things that come along with Christianity. And I, I said, I believe. And at this point, Jesus was sort of on side with me and I could feel all of that guilt dissipate. And it was like, yes, you are a part of that covenant. You are a part of forgiveness. That does not follow you. You know, you are. He says, you know, when when you come into heaven, you're given white robes, you're given new clothing, you're given a new a new existence. That's the powerful thing. You, you, if you have that opportunity of knowing Jesus and knowing what He is and who He is, and how He can cleanse you of guilt, that is the powerful, powerful thing. That once you get through 
and you're beyond this life. That's what really matters. Um, unforgiveness, I think, is one of the greatest problems and difficulties that people have got to get out of their lives. In in Australia, we had uh, it was it was an amazing thing, really. We had a um, a priest of the Assyrian Church in Sydney was was actually stabbed by a young oh, radicalized man. yeah b- Muslim boy, and um, he, he survived. He was okay, and the boy was arrested and dragged away. There was all sorts of riots outside the church. They were absolutely oh, horrible, unbelievable. Yeah, and um, that that beautiful priest, he just said. I forgive that boy, you know, I forgive that boy. I understand he's been, you know, brainwashed, radicalised, whatever, but I forgive him and I love him, you know. And that, to me, that sort of sums up the the goal of what we've got to head towards is there, there is no point in an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. There is no point in vengeance. There is no point in that. Look where it leads, where it leads to his Gaza. Or- yeah. Yeah, I saw yeah. someone praying over him. They had him like pinned yeah. to the floor, and it was just so heart wrenching to watch mm. that. It was incredible experience. Yeah, it, it it really was a beautiful beautiful moment when when the priest yeah. forgave. Him. I just thought, yes, that that's the victory. That's the victory we need. Um, love your enemies. Love right. your enemies. Right. That is so important. And that boy, would the world be a different place if if that was put into practice? Oh. It sure would be. So someone asked, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but it was a question out there. Why are humans here? What's our purpose? They said they just know. Like, and I'm like, that's a loaded question. I'll put it out there, but (laughs) (laughs) Uh, look, it's it's so different when when you actually leave this world and get into that heavenly dimension it's so different god is so good god is so loving and god is so powerful that i actually believe our existence is just to be worshiping him to be loving him to be joined with him and and i know it sounds like hey what so what but wow when you experience it, it it is the highest thing you can experience to know and feel God. He, he is so immense and universal and beautiful and powerful and loving. To be aligned and joined with him, I can see no higher purpose. And, and I don't think you really understand that when you're in this world. It, it's not until you get beyond it and you realise, whoa, this is something way above what I can comprehend or, or ever imagine or think of. And this is why, you know, we see in, in the book of Revelation and things like that, the angels, the elders just bowing down and saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they don't stop. They just keep going. They just keep singing it forever. And that's the sort of height at which I, I imagine that's our real true purpose in the long run. And does this mean God's got a massive ego? Well, we're measuring it by very human standards if we say that. Right. God is who he is. I mean, that's his name. I am who I am. I am what I am. And he's the giver of life. He's the giver of love. He's the giver of everything. And and for us to love him is really for us to love ourselves, you know, in in the long run. So the more we love God, the more we love ourselves, the more complete we are. That, to me, is the purpose of our existence. Yeah, that that makes that's a good answer. I think it's a, it's a simple answer, and I think it's a real good answer. Um, okay, so trying to see, it says here many of us who have been under anesthesia or surgery have not experienced um, anything. It's just like a void, and then when some have died, um, they say that some have gotten to see God and some haven't like in your case why is it that i guess their feelings are hurt that they died and they didn't have an nde and they were trying to like put that into words like why did you get so fortunate to have one and jane didn't she died the same way yeah look look i think look there is this very real factor if they're here to tell the story they have not died they've come back 
Now, I, I think there is the difference. The point of difference is, has my soul left my body? Now, for these people, I don't really believe it has. I believe it's just stayed intact, just waiting, waiting it out, knowing that they were going to be revived. Um, so, yeah, that's why they haven't had an NDE. It's very simple. You never left. You never went. Uh, well, what about the ones that were clinically dead like you? So it was no, documented. Doesn't, doesn't mean the soul's gone. That just means the machine oh, shut down. Oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, it, it, it's not until the soul actually detaches and says, I'm out of here, that's when I think you get into NDE territory because the soul, the removal of the soul from the body is what I think is the one that triggers the NDE experiences. Wow, I never thought about that, but that makes total sense. So your soul has to completely detach and then, but does God, do you think that God always gives you a choice to come back or not and, or no. So sometimes it's just written that this is it for you. You're, you're off. Remember we are dealing with God here. Um, right. He does tend to, tends to know everything. Right. <laughs> the ultimate know-it-all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so look, I was given a choice. Okay. I know of many other NDEs where people are just point blank told, no, it's not your time back you go and obviously for all the others which is the vast majority they are told no your time has come and you end up passing through to where where you pass through uh but yeah that that is very much on an individual basis i think and and god deals with individuals and is well capable of doing so uh, according to what their situation is and for me it was very situationally based and he knew very well I was going to choose to come back, but uh, he gave me a choice. He didn't just send me back. Yeah. Maybe, do you think that that the people like yourself that have had NDEs and, and get to come back, um, do you think that, that God does that? Well, of course he does. I guess I'm trying to make sense of my question. You, you turned your NDE into something beautiful. You, you're sharing it with other people. You wrote a book about it. You're spreading the word of the, you know, the gospel and Jesus. And do, do you think that the folks that have had NDEs but do nothing about it, what's the point? Do you think the point is just to change their lives? Oh, it can be that simple, most definitely. Um, uh, God's not really vindictive, you know, and, and um, he's, he told me right from, if you remember, right from, the very point at which I was having a heart attack, he said to me, you're going to die, but I have things for you to do. Like, I've been assigned a mission um, by him, and I'm very aware of that. Right from the start, that was the deal. You're going to die, but I have things for you to do. So it took me seven years to write a book. Uh, I sat on it for a long, long time and, and was a little bit afraid, a little bit cautious, about the response because I had a big variety of responses. Some were extremely negative. Actually, some from Christians were extremely negative, which surprised me. But how so? Um, like, could you give us an example. What would they oh, say? What were some of the really negative responses? They um, I won't mention any names, of course. But I had no. one person just just basically accuse me of being a charlatan and, and of fabricating this and doing it to make money. Oh. And I was able to say back, well, I've actually lost money, not made money. <laughs> but uh, uh, that sort of response, you expect me to believe this rubbish, you know, this is not how it all works, I know how it works, you're just making this up. Uh, that's the sort of response I got from a few Christians, very few, not, not many. Um, then, of course, you get the response from the more analytical scientific which is straight away oh no 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 that's just you're just hallucinating your brain's just shutting down it's the chemicals in your mind and you know just don't don't bother us with this we don't believe it um is the more common response sure. but a lot of people and i'm talking people who don't even believe in god i'm just talking general people are intrigued by this they want to know mm -hmm. they really want to know what's going to happen to them and their loved ones when they die and that's just natural and normal. And, um, you know, well, really, I believe I've got some very good news for you, you know, and there, there are things you can do now to actually 
prepare for that so that when the time comes, you know, you're all good with God. You, you're in with him. You know, you, you understand he understands you. You understand him. You have a clear conscience before him. That's a great way to pass over if you can, if you can go that way. And that's where Jesus is so helpful because he says to you, you know, in advance, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're set free. It's just forgive other people and you're forgiven. It's that simple. Um, another question, a few of them, were, was about the prophecies part. Now, I know you mentioned that a lot of that was personal and that, you know, you, you mm -hmm. couldn't really share it. They want to know, like, what prophecy you received during your NDE that you could talk about that was prophetic and really shook you to your core. Is there anything that you can talk about? Because we had a few questions on that. Wow. Look, look, there was something, I won't use the word weird, but something unusual going on when I was shown the future. Some of it I've been allowed to remember. Some of it has just simply been erased from my memory. I, I just do not remember what I was shown. And that was something Jesus was talking with the angels about at the time. And he can see this. Don't let him see that. It, it was very selective about what they wanted me to be aware of. The things, a couple of things I were was aware of was was personal things like a person I would meet right. and know for many years, um, things that might occur in my life. But it's been an ongoing process, and this is more like I can now read the Book of Revelation and really understand it, which is quite an achievement. Uh, it's such a convoluted, complex book, but I mean, it's. It's talking about things that are to come that, that are on, on a massive scale. And um, I, I really do understand what it's talking about now. And, and there's some really interesting things in there. But basically, if I told you that the book of Revelation was predicting drone warfare on a massive scale, if it was predicting the Earth being struck by an asteroid or a comet, I mean, they're the sorts of things that it's predicting. Um, and very clearly, but people, for some reason, they have trouble understanding and, and reading that. But God's basically using it as a warning to us and saying, there is a time of trouble coming on the earth such as has never been. That's that's the words it uses. Well, that's the truth. Which is, it's big. It's big. Um, and, and that is very clearly described in, in the prophecies of the Bible. You know, the, Isaiah chapter 24 amazing to read uh, the earth is dried up the earth is shaken like a hut the, the there's other places where it talks about the stars being rolled up like a scroll now that's the earth shifting on its axis yeah. <laughs> we're talking something big because like if people just think of it as symbolic they don't really get what it's about this right, is right. actually talking about the real thing um something is at some point in history going to strike the earth it's going to make the sun go dark it's going to fill the air uh, the air with dust mm. and it's going to poison a lot of people and it's going to be terrifying and it says the people will run to the caves and, and you know hide under the earth and say save us save us from the wrath of god that's what it's predicting and i mean you know we know they have bunkers mm. and if something like that happened that is exactly where the, the powerful people of the earth would go that is into those bunkers and say, save us. Oh, sure. Uh, and so much of what is written in these ancient prophecies, God's just opened my eyes to. And, and um, it talks about, you, you know. As, like the book of Revelation. Hmm? Do you ever read like the book of Revelations and then something like you'll get a flashback or, or remember something that was shown to you? Yeah. Yeah, and it's more in the present tense, really, rather than a flashback to the NDE. It's more, it, it just opens my eyes to things. Like like I was just reading about in Revelation and in Joel and in a few books, it talks about this army of locusts coming over the land and that the noise of the locusts was deafening and they were shooting fire out of their tails and before them the, the, the earth was like the Garden of Eden and behind them it was a wasteland. And God just opened my eyes and I just saw drones, thousands of drones coming over the land and just zapping and, and exploding things. And look at what just happened with Iran and Israel. I mean, exactly. it, it's it's very likely to take yeah. place at some point. And um, 
that that's exactly what I believe the book is about. The prophecies are about, and, and God's just showing me these things in. Wow, this is this is how it's going to happen. This is how it's going to occur. I mean, look, I may be wrong, but that's just what He's showing me, and um, I'm just quite happy to share that with people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I read something the other day in 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 the Book of Revelations that confused me. I think it was verse two, chapter eight, and Jesus was talking about when the devil influences you. I can't remember it verbatim. I'm sorry, but something about you will suffer for 10 days, something to do with 10 days. Do you remember reading that? Something about the <laughs> devil influencing you and that you would have to suffer for 10 days. And it, the number of days just stood out to me. And I was talking about it with a friend of mine and we couldn't figure out what this 10 day thing was. Often in Revelation, a day stands for a year. And there's certainly a uh, very pointed times where it says for three and a half days this will take place and then it says for 1260 days this will take place and that is three and a half years so it's it's very literal in what it's saying there will be a time and it's talking about what we refer to as the reign of the antichrist which is very heavily prophesied which is something very evil yes. uh coming and actually controlling at least the land of Israel, at the very least, but possibly the whole earth. And this this is virtually like the devil incarnate. This is this is a very evil being, a bit like if Adolf Hitler had have taken over the world. Right. It's that sort of scenario. Um, and it says this this will go on for three and a half years. This will go on for three and a half days, or times, time, and half a time. It says. So it, it, it's very specific about that sort of time period. It talks about um, a peace agreement being brought in by this Antichrist person in the book of Daniel. And it, it says in Revelation, the time will be cut short for the sake of the elect, for those who God loves. So th there's all sorts of time frames and predictions in there that we probably won't fully understand until they happen. But they are very specific, like you say. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of prophecies, um, was there anything good? Like, did you get any oh. hope for us? <laughs> was there any anything hope? good? Oh, boy. Um, this is the interesting thing. It, it refers to about it as the pangs of childbirth. The earth is going through the pangs of childbirth. This is this time of trouble such as we've never seen. But what's to follow? is so amazing and and honestly look we, we never could imagine um the things that are predicted is that basically jesus with the angelic hosts will come to the earth like this is going to be the dimension will open up and heaven will open up and come and take the earth this this is basically what's predicted so it's not an alien invasion it's not little green men with ray guns but this is this is angelic forces coming to the earth because it says if i did not come at this point nothing would survive no life would survive that's how severe things are going to get but jesus promises us he's going to come and save the earth from destruction then there will be set up on earth a, a heavenly kingdom where where god is here with us in person and and ruling things for us because we have demonstrated amply that um we make a mess of it so basically the door the doorway of heaven will be opened literally and heaven and earth I mean, at the end of days at the end of end of days yeah end of days. Do, do you believe though that the good will suffer along with the wicked during this because you can't you know if there's a catastrophe um yeah. and god Look does that aren't the good going to suffer too like how does that work colin it's very interesting look there, there's such a controversy even within the church about this um they talk a lot about the rapture which is the lifting off of, of god's chosen ones and, and jesus talked about this and revelation talks about this certain certain people will be lifted up but it also talks about many people will suffer tribulation is the word it uses uh, and this will be a time where 
there will be suffering. I, I don't think we can totally avoid that. The most the most optimistic of Christians believe we're just going to be lifted off before it all starts <laughs> and everything will be fine. Uh, I'm not of that school. I, I think Jesus gave us very clear warnings. No, you, you're going to suffer persecution for your faith is one thing. I actually believe Christianity is going to come under a lot of um, persecution. Oh, it already is. Uh, yeah, and you'll be taken before courts and you'll be locked up in prison and, and things are going to happen. People will probably die as well. It's not going to be a pretty scenario. I don't, I'm not quite sure how that's going to happen, but it seems to be linked in with this antichrist possible world government scenario right. that, that could right. be coming up. That's a whole other that conversation. Works, yeah, how that works I won't go into, but um, I don't have all the answers for that. What, what basically I understand is that at a certain point, Point through this terrible time, God will lift off his people. It, it, he's very clear about that. At a certain point, it may be at the actual coming of the heavenly host with Jesus, mm. it may be before that, but God will actually lift off his people. I mean, this could be like a, a, a fleet of UFOs coming and just lifting us off the planet. It could be that. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I suspect it may be that, yeah. you know, quite possibly. Not aliens, but angels. Right. Um, and that we'll just be lifted off and that then it, it, it talks about the woes that come on the earth and the punishment and says the people of the earth will refuse to repent or refuse to change their life to, to do better. Um, and there will be this standoff between the people that are left and the forces of heaven. And, well, quite frankly, it says the forces of heaven are going to win. The light of God will come onto the earth and things will be totally transformed for this planet. It talks about the deserts blooming. It talks about great joy. It talks about, you know, the lion will lay down with the lamb. It's this beautiful imagery of this, this heavenly age where, where humanity won't be subject to death any longer. Do you think this is all Lucifer's doing? Yeah. yeah. Well, unquestionably, yeah, yeah. We're, we're talking a being that, that likes to think he's God. He, he's a very powerful being from the dawn of time, and uh, he is out to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, he wants to destroy God's creation, and he wants to set up his own chaotic reign. Uh, I mean, that's that's basically what it gets down to. It sounds like sci-fi. It really does. Mm. But this is what's written about right throughout history and um, there is very obvious evidence in the earth of a malicious evil force that that tries to destroy that that's just the way it is having been outside of this earth i can really vouch for that it's not there when, when you're there there is just not this deathly evil decaying atmosphere that that exists here in this in this realm uh, and and we're looking forward to a time when death will be no more that's that's the prophecies that's what it's predicting and um we will live a delightful divine and wonderful life uh, in in love in peace in prosperity and uh, that's that's the good news that, yeah. that comes after this terrible time that god's warning us about can i ask you one more question i know we're a little past the the hour if you don't mind yeah i guess i'm a little confused as to because i'm a Christian, Catholic, and a Jesus believer, you know, he's my Lord and Savior. Um, why is it that Lucifer was allowed to have dominion over the earth and over humans? Do you think it was because of free will, the whole thing, back to free will? Like, God being so mighty and powerful, why didn't he just smite Lucifer? The minute he rebelled against God, why didn't he just do away with him? Yeah, look, look, that is that is a really interesting question and one I have thought long and hard on. The, the conclusion I come to is that God is bound by his own laws. God creates the laws of the universe and he acts within those laws. Mm -hmm. So I, I think a lot of our existence has been effectively an ongoing legal court case on Satan, on, on evil. Uh, and the first Adam, the sin, the serpent in the garden, all that, everybody died because Adam blew it. Right. 
everyone has died ever since, according to this this teaching. And what that truly means, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But all I know is that humanity has been cursed ever since then. I suspect we were cast down a dimension. Mm. I suspect that's what it actually means. And that our physical life is not where we were originally created, but that we, we've been thrown down to this level, uh, which is why we have death. And that is something God wanted to prove unjust because it was unjust. It was the result of a lie. It was the result of a deception. And uh, that's why he sent Jesus, because just as through Adam, everybody gets stuck with sin and death, which is not pleasant. So through Jesus, everybody gets to experience love and life. Uh, so it's like the other side of the coin that he's provided. And it was just to prove, because Jesus came into a human body, God incarnate into a human body, never sinned, never did the wrong thing, and yet died. And that at that moment, that is why that was so powerful, because it just split the whole universe open, because it, it proved that that law of sin and death is wrong. It is not just. It is not fair on all of humanity who, who's been put under this curse of death. And Jesus just broke that curse in one moment on the cross. That was it. It was gone. And um, ever since then, it's been, well, the gradual expansion of the kingdom of God on earth, and that's just going to continue and continue until in these last times he actually comes back and, and takes command of his kingdom once again. Uh, and, and that's that's a time that's coming. I don't believe it's too far away. I'm not going to try and predict dates because there's not a good history for predicting dates. Right. But, uh, that's absolutely what I believe. God has used Jesus, put himself into a human body to prove that Satan is wrong and to cast him down. That makes a lot of sense. Because I, I always wondered, like, why God being God, he just didn't, you know, alle alleviate our suffering from the get-go and just do abolish satan but I, that makes a lot of sense that he obeys his own laws that he created here so i never thought about that but that that helps gee i i hope someday we can have a really good biblical conversation that would be awesome <laughs> thank you sure so would. much colin <laughs> and of course i'll have uh running across the screen where folks can purchase your book and um Again, if they have any questions, leave them in the comments and I'll be sure to reach out to you when they start to pile up. <laughs> can I can I just say a little word to all the of people course. who might be watching this? Yeah. Look, um, all of this must sound to some of you like absolute space cadet. What the heck? Whoop, whoop, whoop. Where is this coming from? Just keep in mind, this, this is coming from writings that have been around for thousands of years. These are ancient prophecies that have not gone away, that, that have been implanted on the earth through these writings by God. And he's warning us and giving us advance instructions on how to deal with this. And that's what the prophetic words of the Bible are all about. And that's like I'm, we're talking a third of the Bible. We're talking a lot. Uh, so, so don't imagine that this is just craziness. Realise that there is something timeless behind this and there is something divine behind this. And just try opening up your mind to the possibilities that perhaps there are angels up there who care for us and have been watching us right throughout history and are trying to help us through and to bring us to the next level of God's plan for us. That was so well said, Colin. Thank you so much. And of course, I will be in touch. And thank you and God bless. Thank you and God bless you too, Colin. Have a great one, Colin. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.